this episode, the second. The second is the duration of 9,192,631,770 periods of the radiation corresponding to the two hyperfine levels of the ground state of the cesium-133 atom. The second is one of the most fundamental measures of our world. But how do we define the second? How do we know how long a second is? Well, we need three things. First of all, we need something that ticks. Then we need to be able to count those ticks. And we have to know how many of those ticks occur in one second. So, what I have here is a rudimentary clock, a um, pendulum clock, uh, similar to the grandfather clocks that we all know. And this generates ticks by the swings that it gives you. And in this case, each swing is about half a second. And so we know how many ticks we have in a second. Unfortunately, this is not terribly accurate. Historically, the most common method of measuring time has been to use the length of the day. This has been the case since Egyptian times, when even then the concept of dividing the day into hours, minutes and seconds was used. However, the problem is that the rotation of the Earth is not constant. And so what we really need is a much more stable tick to define the second. This is the bank of atomic clocks that the NPL uses to define the UK timescale. We use atomic clocks because they are based on the unchanging constants of physics. But the question is, how do these atomic clocks work? So imagine this as our atom. Here we have a nucleus around which we have electrons orbiting the nucleus at certain predetermined distances from the nucleus itself. So there are electrons in orbits very close to the nucleus and other electrons in orbits further out from the nucleus. When we excite the atom with microwaves, what we're doing, in effect, is promoting the electron in the outermost shell to an orbit which is even further out from the nucleus. And in order to do this, we have to provide a precise amount of energy that corresponds to the energy gap between the initial shell and the final shell we can relate this specific energy to a specific frequency. If you imagine the waveform associated with this frequency, when we detect the frequency, we see a waveform with a series of crests and troughs. And in the detection process, we can register each crest in time as a single tick. We're using microwaves, so there are billions of ticks per second. We use cesium atoms in our atomic clocks because they're stable, relatively easy to handle, and provide us with a very high frequency microwave frequency or tick. This is important for applications such as GPS, satellite navigation, 
where the orbiting spacecraft around the Earth use cesium, commercial cesium clocks in the spacecraft themselves. But here we have the most accurate cesium clock that's available in, in the UK. This is the cesium fountain. And there are similar cesium fountains in other standards laboratories around the world. In this arrangement, what we do is cool the cesium atoms to temperatures very close to absolute zero using laser systems. So we create a cloud of very cold atoms trapped in this volume down here. And then we launch these cold atoms up through the apparatus and they fall back down under gravity. We're interested in using the cold atoms because they're not moving very fast and that gives us more time to make our measurements. As the atoms travel up and fall back, they are probed by microwaves within this region. And using this arrangement, we can develop a very precise atomic clock that has an uncertainty that is equivalent to about one part, one second in 60 million years. Our tick is so fast that it takes up to 9 billion of them to make up a second. Although we can measure these ticks very accurately here at MPL, it's important that we are able to relay this time scale to other members of the community. Uh, and in order to do this, we distribute our time signal um, not from here, but from a location in Sellafield on a lower frequency, which is related to atomic time. And that signal can be picked up, for example, from Gibraltar through to Iceland. Whatever you use at home or in industry to tell the time, that information can be traced back directly to the atomic clocks that we use here at MPL. And in this episode, the meter. This is the vault where we keep the UK's copy of the meter bar. It's made of uh, an alloy of platinum and iridium. It's a very valuable metal, uh, which is why we have to keep it locked away very safe underground. In fact, it's so precious that we require several keys to gain entrance, and so I require some assistance from my colleague Michael to enter the meter vault. Thank you. 
the definition of a metre based upon metal bars, such as this one which we have here, was in place for over half a century. And during that time, metal bars such as this one, which is the official UK copy of the metre, were the most accurate um, length standards which were available at the time. Nowadays, however, artefacts such as this are really uh, part of the uh, archive and the latest realisation of the definition of the metre comes from things we can look at in the laboratory upstairs. The speed of light is a fundamental constant of the universe. It has a fixed value of 299.792.458 meters per second. That means that in exactly one second, light will travel that many meters. If we take the reciprocal of this, in that small fraction of a second, light will actually travel one meter. Now that's a very good definition of the meter because it's fixed and it does not rely upon a single artifact. The problem with the definition of the meter as it stands is that it's very difficult to realize in practice. You need to have a very, very accurate source of timing. Instead, we can use a process called interferometry. In an interferometer such as this one, we can actually compare the length of physical objects against the wavelength of light. To do this, we need a wavelength which is very, very precise and accurately reproducible. So for that, we need a very precise laser, such as this laser which we have here. This is one of the lasers that we use to realize the definition of the meter here at NPL. The laser emits a light of one particular wavelength. It's monochromatic. We use light from this laser in the interferometer and compare the wavelength of the light directly against the length of the object that we're measuring. The key thing is that the definition of the meter is now based upon a fundamental constant. That means that the meter is now fixed for all time. It's unchanging and will be the same anywhere in the universe.